just for two important questions in single cell RNA sequencing data. So namely cell type annotation and clustering. So I'll just start with some big picture motivation for this work. Um, single cell RNA sequencing, as I'm sure most or all of us are familiar with, uh, enables gene expression measurements on the level of individual cells. This is very valuable since it allows us to characterize distinct cell type populations within different samples and tissues. And in particular, we're often interested in two types of characterization. One is annotating known cell types, and the other is discovering potentially novel cell type populations. A number of methods have already been proposed for both of these challenges, but many are heuristic in nature and don't assume an underlying probabilistic model. Something that we'll show today is that we find that many of these existing methods don't adequately account for underlying sources of variation, which can lead to misclassifications in the cell type annotation context and false discoveries in the unsupervised clustering context. So in our work, we propose a probabilistic model for gene expression in single cell RNA-seq data that does explicitly account for underlying variation and allow us to quantify the uncertainty in our predictions. Using this model, we then develop approaches for both of these challenges. So first, we enable probabilistic annotation of cell types using something called gene expression barcodes. Um, and this is joint work with my advisor, Rafa Urizari. And then second, we develop a model-based hypothesis testing approach for clustering using significance analysis. And this is joint work again with Rafa Urizari and Kelly Street. So I'm going to start with the first project I mentioned here, which is cell type annotation. So existing methods for cell type annotation can, broadly speaking, be divided into two main types. The first are clustering-based methods, in which we begin by performing unsupervised clustering of our data, finding differentially expressed genes across those clusters, and then annotating each cluster based on our knowledge of those genes. Some downsides of these methods are that they can be very challenging to automate, since we require both manual and expert knowledge of those differentially expressed genes. The second issue is that there's no guarantee the clusters we find actually correspond to our cell types of interest. Reference-based methods avoid many of these pitfalls by instead classifying cells into cell types given reference data for each of our cell types of interest. While reference-based methods avoid the disadvantages I mentioned earlier, we find that in practice, many of the existing methods are highly sensitive to batch effects and prone to overfitting. In our work, we aim to address these challenges by developing a reference-based approach using a model that satisfies three key characteristics. First, our model is parsimonious, which can help reduce overfitting. Second, we assume latent states for each gene, which allows us to represent every cell type with what we call a gene expression barcode. And finally, we explicitly model within state variability in a way that can help decrease the influence of batch effects. Once we have our model, we can then simply classify every unknown cell by identifying the cell type label that yields the highest posterior probability under our model. And so something I'll emphasize here is that we're actually obtaining probabilistic classifications of each cell because we report the probability of every cell belonging to every cell type of interest. And this can help us understand what kind of uncertainty we have in our predictions. So that's the big picture overview of the approach. I'm now going to describe this model in some more detail. So as I mentioned, we assume a latent states model. And in particular, we assume that within any given cell type, every gene can belong to one of two latent states. Either it's on, indicating the gene is expressed, or it's off, indicating that it's unexpressed. In practice, based on our data exploration, we actually choose to further subdivide this off state into two components, an off low component representing very low but not necessarily zero expression, and an off null component representing essentially zero expression. Every cell type can then be represented with a gene expression barcode 
that's characterized by these probabilities of each gene belonging to each of these latent states. Our model is then further informed by two main observations, which I'll illustrate through this figure here. Here in this figure, every row corresponds to a different gene. And then within a given row, every tick mark represents the average expression of that gene in a different cell type. So we're looking at the distribution of these genes over many different cell types. As we can see within each of these genes, we see separation into a lower expressing off state and a higher expressing on state. And so the first observation I'll point out is that we have variability, sometimes a lot of variability within these states, meaning within a given off state or within a given on state, we have quite a bit of spread of expression. The second observation is that the means and variances of these states are gene specific, meaning both the locations of these off and on states and their spreads are changing from gene to gene. And in some cases, these gene-specific shifts can be so large that, for example, if we look at this bottommost gene, there's some expression that would fall into the on state, but had it been observed in this topmost gene, it would have fallen in the off state. So it's actually critical that we correctly account for and model these gene-specific shifts when determining which latent state a given gene falls to in a certain cell type. So more specifically, um, if we let xij denote the count of gene j in cell i, then conditional on the cell type label k, we model xij as arising from a Poisson distribution whose rate parameter is the product of two terms. The first, n sub i, can just be thought of as a cell-specific normalization factor, whereas the second, lambda jk, is our main quantity of interest. And we interpret lambda jk as being proportional to the expected gene expression for gene j in cell type k. And it's these lambda jks that we treat as realizations of a random variable governed by the latent states model I just described. So in particular, if we define state indicators zjk for every gene j in every cell type k, that can be one of three states the off-null, off-low, or on, then depending on the value of zjk, we assume a different distribution for that rate lambda. So for example, if a given gene falls into the off-null component, we model lambda with an exponential distribution. And then if a given gene falls into either the off-low or on components, then we model lambda as following one of two log normal distributions. In these log normal distributions, we can interpret the mean parameters as representing the gene specific means of the off and on distributions respectively. And analogously, we can interpret these standard deviations as quantifying the gene specific variability, which includes any potential variability due to batch effects. So in order to learn the parameters of this model, we use a large resource called the Panglao DB database, which includes over 200 diverse single cell experiments spanning many different cell types. We fit this mixture model I just described to every gene across the single cell experiments in this database using an expectation maximization algorithm. Once we learn those parameters for each gene's distribution, going forward, we treat these gene specific parameter estimates as frozen meaning we did this step once and we store these parameters in our software and we never have to repeat this step again. So when we want to actually annotate cell types in a data set of unlabeled cells, the only remaining unknown quantities are the latent states for every cell type. So for any given classification task, the only thing we require as input is reference data for each cell type of interest. Then for every such cell type K, we can estimate the probability of every gene belonging to one of these three latent states, the off-null, off-low, or on, based on the observed gene counts in the reference data and our learned frozen gene-specific distributions. These probabilities over all the genes constitute the barcode for cell type K. Next, 
And one quick aside I'll make here is that even independent of classification, we can think of these barcodes themselves as being useful tools in their own right to characterize cell types. And later on, I'll show some examples of how we might see these barcodes being useful in this way. So once we've trained our model obtaining those barcodes for every cell type in our reference data, the next step is to actually label each of the cells that we want to annotate. To do this, we can just compute the posterior probability of observing each unlabeled cell from each cell type under our model, just using this expression here from Bayes' rule. For computational simplicity, we assume that we have independence across genes, which lets us decompose this likelihood term into this product, which thus enables very fast computation of this expression. So from our model, we end up with this natural and quite computationally efficient way to just compute the probability of every cell belonging to every cell type. And if we want to give a final answer, we can just choose whatever cell type label gave the highest posterior probability for every cell. In many applications, we might also expect there to be cell types present that aren't represented in the reference. This might be because there's a cell type we didn't expect to see, there might be a rare cell type that we just don't have reference data for, or there may even be a novel cell population. So to address scenarios like this, we also construct an average cell type barcode where the probability of each gene belonging to each state is just averaged over all of the cell types from the PanglaoDB database. The idea is that we just treat this as an additional cell type barcode and allow the possibility for any cell to be assigned to that class. And if a cell is assigned to that class, then we just interpret that as meaning that this cell has an unknown identity. So here is a benchmark to show some example results comparing our barcode approach to existing reference-based methods on four assessment data sets. Something I'll emphasize here is that we constructed these assessment data sets very carefully. And in particular, we always ensured that the reference data and the test data come from two completely different studies. So if you focus first on this leftmost panel here, um, our barcode approach is shown in the top row. And then for each data set, we report two quantities the accuracy of all cell type assignments that were made by each method, and in parentheses, the percent of cells that were actually assigned labels, as opposed to being indicated as unknown identity. As you can see in the lung, colon, and brain data sets, our approach had the highest accuracy out of all methods that were able to assign labels to the majority of cells. In the last data set, the PBMC's data set, where all methods essentially did very well, our approach had within 1.5% of the highest accuracy. If we now look over here at this rightmost panel, we report the ratio of the accuracy in these external test sets to a withheld test set constructed of cells from the same data as the reference. Here, a ratio close to one would mean that the method performed very similarly between the two, whereas a ratio far below one would mean that a method did much better in the withheld data than the external data. In other words, suggesting that a given method had overfit. In our approach, the ratios were close to one across all four of the data sets, whereas by contrast, nearly every other method had at least one data set with a ratio far below one. This suggests that in addition to having very high accuracy overall, our approach also showed great robustness to overfitting when compared to existing methods. Isabella, one yes. quick um, um, understanding question. Sorry for the interruption. No problem. What are, what are these NAs are standing for? Silicine couldn't be run on these brain data set. And what is these, these are NAs and percentages assigned? Yeah, absolutely. So in the case of Silicine for the brain data set, on this run, Celesign actually labeled all of the cells as like unknown or other, so no cell type labels were assigned. And then for Castle, the reason for the NAs in the parentheses is because Castle doesn't have a, a built-in approach to label a cell as unknown, so by default, all cells were assigned labels. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So I'd mentioned earlier that another advantage of our barcoding approach is that we also gain extra interpretability under our barcodes themselves. So I'm now going to show two examples of how we can use the barcode as a way to gain interpretability um, in a given classification task. In this first example, we consider a set of data where we have mixed capillary and artery cells. So by applying our barcoding approach, we can understand exactly which genes are the most important in distinguishing capillary from artery cells, which are two very similar cell types. In the plot I'm showing you here, every dot represents a different gene, and I'm comparing the probability of observing a non-zero count of that gene in a capillary cell as compared to an artery cell. Unsurprisingly, most genes fall along this diagonal, indicating a very similar expression pattern between these two cell types, with many fewer genes falling on the off diagonal. In blue, I'm indicating the top 50 genes that contributed the most to distinguishing the capillary from the artery cells in our mixed test set. As you can see, the majority of these top 50 genes fell into this off diagonal region. This shows how the barcode can tell us which genes are the most critical in classification decisions, which is helpful for two reasons. The first is it may help us understand computationally which genes are most useful in distinguishing a set of cell types. And the second is that by looking at the identities of those genes, we may also gain some biological insight or understanding about what makes two cell types different. The other example I sh I'll show is using the barcode as a way to understand how we can diagnose marker genes as being effective or not for various cell types. So here's an example where we consider four potential marker genes for CD4 cells. So here, the blue and the red densities, respectively, represent our learned off and on states for each of these genes. Every gray tick mark represents the average expression of that gene in a different cell type, and the black arrows indicate actual average expression of that gene in a set of CD4 cells. If we focus on the first and third genes here, we can see that the black arrow indicating the average expression in CD4 cells, while definitely falling in the on state, is towards that left lower tail. This suggests that even though this gene may be on in CD4 cells, it is still lowly expressed and thus may not be an effective marker for CD4 cells. If we look instead at the second gene, we see we have much higher expression of this gene than the previous two, but the off and the on distributions have a substantial amount of overlap, which means again that this gene may not be very effective as a marker gene to distinguish CD4 cells from others. Finally, if we look at this bottommost gene, we see that we have both high expression of this gene and very good separation between the off and on distributions. But this time we see we have many ticks that fall into the on component, which suggests that this gene is also expressed in many other cell types. And so it may not be a very specific marker for CD4 cells. So this was a relatively simple example, but helps illustrate by how just looking at the learned parameters associated with the barcode we can gain some understanding of why some genes may or may not be effective markers. So in summary, we have defined a statistical model of gene expression and introduced barcodes as a way to represent cell types through their membership in latent states. This gave rise to a very natural and computationally efficient approach to annotating cell types, which we were able to show outperforms existing methods on real data and provides interpretation results. So I'll now transition to our uh, second project that I'm just going to discuss today, which is clustering. So supervised approaches to cell type annotation, uh, like the one we just discussed, uh, can be highly effective in many contexts. But when the goal is to discover novel cell type populations, unsupervised methods like clustering become critical. However, Popular clustering workflows are generally based on heuristic optimization rather than probabilistic models. While heuristic assumptions can sometimes be reasonable, there's no guarantee you're not under or over clustering 
and no natural expression of uncertainty in the clusters that you find. Overclustering can be particularly insidious because we find that clustering algorithms will partition data even in scenarios where there's only uninteresting random noise present. Here's an example where I generated 1,000 cells all under the exact same Poisson log normal model and then applied the Seurat implementation of the Louvain algorithm at three different resolutions. At the lowest resolution tested, we still found two clusters. And then at the highest resolution tested, which is also the default resolution in this algorithm, we found a total of five clusters. And so even though all these cells were generated under exactly the same model, meaning there shouldn't be any cluster structure present, at default specifications, we can still find as many as five clusters. What makes this problem even more challenging is that cells that have been incorrectly clustered can have genes that appear to be differentially expressed with spuriously small p-values. This is due to something called data snooping bias or double dipping. But essentially, because we cluster cells on the basis of their gene expression, we're artificially inflating any differences that might be there, even if those differences are just due to noise. As a result, overclustered output can appear to show convincing differences, even when we truly have overclustering present. To address these challenges, we propose a model based approach to clustering that allows us to explicitly account for this kind of variability when both finding and assessing clusters. In particular, we choose to use a hypothesis testing framework based on the model I described previously that we then directly embed into hierarchical clustering. So in the work I just described, we had assumed a mixture model of expression that had on and off components. And for computational simplicity there, we had chosen to treat genes as independent. However, based on our exploratory analysis in the clustering context, we instead found that gene correlations play a critical role when defining distinct cell populations. So one modification that we make to the model I presented before is that we now model expressed genes as following correlated rather than independent Poisson log normal distributions. So using this parametric model, if we have a total of capital J genes, we can just refer to this joint distribution of expression as capital F. We then define a cluster K as a population of cells whose gene expression is all generated from exactly the same joint distribution F sub K. The premise of our approach is that in a correct clustering solution, the cells in each cluster should come from the same distribution F sub K. So if all the cells in our data can be described by a single distribution F, we should just have one cluster. And if instead they can be described by say eight different distributions, we should have eight corresponding clusters. So in order to produce clusters that follow this premise, we propose two different implementations of our framework. The first is a hierarchical clustering approach that automatically identifies clusters corresponding to distinct distributions. And the second is a significance analysis approach that can be applied to any pre-computed set of clusters to check whether or not they satisfy this assumption. So I'm going to start by describing the very simple two-cluster case, which serves as the foundation for both of these implementations. So let's suppose that we have a set of cells that we've clustered into two groups, and then let's say we compute some kind of measure of separation between them. So here I'm going to focus on the example of the ward linkage function, which just measures the change in variance when the cells are in one cluster versus two. So a larger ward linkage value would mean that we have greater separation between the clusters. So once we've created these two clusters, we can then take an empirical approach and ask, is this observed ward linkage value larger than what we would expect to see if the cells had been generated by a single distribution and then clustered? This question then motivates the following procedure. We can fit our parametric model F that I described to all of the cells together, 
and then simulate a total of capital N data sets where we generate cells under our fitted model F, cluster each of those simulated data sets using the exact same clustering algorithm that we applied to the original data, and then compute the word linkage value in every case. This then gives us an empirical null distribution of word linkages that we could obtain if the cells had truly all come from the same distribution. We can then compute a p-value by looking at the proportion of these empirical null ward linkages that are greater than or equal to our observed ward linkage value. So here's a figure to help illustrate this procedure. If we focus first on the top half of this figure, over here on the left is a PCA plot of some example data that we've clustered into two groups, red and blue. If we compute the word linkage for these two clusters, we get a value of 139. We can then fit our parametric model F to these cells together and then generate many different data sets under that model. Over here in the middle, we show four such example simulated data sets. For each of these data sets, we then apply exactly the same clustering algorithm and then compute the word linkage in each case. Over here on the right, we show a histogram of those word linkage values, and you can see our original observed value of 139 is larger than all of these values under the null. In this case, the p-value is very small, and we're likely to conclude that these cells truly do represent two distinct clusters. If we now focus on this bottom row, again, over here at left is an example of cells that we've clustered into two groups. This time, the word linkage is smaller, 94. Over here in the middle, again, are four example simulated data sets from fitting our model to all the cells together. And finally, here at right is a histogram of those word linkage values compared to our observed value of 94. This time, our observed value is very similar to the values from our empirical null distribution, and the p-value is 0.97. So in this case, we're very likely to conclude that there is no true cluster structure here. So everything I've described so far is what to do in this very simple two cluster setting. But now let's suppose we wanna bring this into a real full single cell data set where we can potentially have many different clusters. So in particular, we bring this into a hierarchical clustering framework by extending some earlier work that studied a similar question in the context of Gaussian data. So let's suppose that we've applied any kind of standard workflow we like to our single cell data set and then run hierarchical clustering on top of that. Over here at the right is a schematic of what the top part of that hierarchical clustering tree might look like. If I were to draw the whole tree, it would go down a, a long way and that very final row of the tree, the leaves, would each represent the individual cells. So the key to this approach is that this hierarchical clustering tree represents all of the structure in the cells via two-way splits, which is important because based on the two cluster case we just worked through, we now already know how to conduct a hypothesis test with two clusters. So in particular, we start at the root node, which I've highlighted here in yellow, which represents splitting all of the cells into two groups, this leftmost group colored in blue and a right group colored in red. And so here at this root node, we can test our null hypothesis and ask, are these two groups, these two clusters, consistent with a single distribution or not? And to conduct this test, we use exactly the procedure I described earlier. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning we don't have enough evidence to believe that these are two different groups, then we can just stop here and conclude that there is no clustering structure in our data. Otherwise, if we do reject the null hypothesis, we can then proceed down to the next node. For example, the one I've colored here in yellow. This node again defines a split between two groups, the blue group on the left and the red group on the right, and we can again test our null hypothesis, but this time at this node. We can proceed iteratively through the tree in this manner, and at any node where we fail to reject, we don't test any further and just conclude that the cells below that node belong to the same cluster. 
So the end result of going over our tree in this manner is we have a final set of clusters that can be interpreted as corresponding to distinct cell type populations. Of course, an important question remaining at this stage is how to handle the multiple sequential hypothesis testing that we had just undergone. To address this problem, we define the family-wise error rate as the probability of at least once falsely rejecting at a node that should represent a single cluster. From previous work that looked at hierarchical testing in the variable selection context, it turns out we can actually control the family-wise error rate at some predefined level alpha by just using this very simple significance cutoff at each node. Here, capital N refers to the total number of cells in the data, and N sub J is the number of cells below node J. So to give some intuition behind this significance cutoff, at the root node, this corresponds to just conducting a test at level alpha. And hypothetically, if we were to reach all the way down to the bottommost row of leaves, this would correspond to just doing a Bonfroni correction. And so any node intermediate between the root and the leaves would just give us some kind of significance cutoff in between the original level alpha and a Bonfroni correction. So computationally speaking, we can actually just run this clustering pipeline a single time at whatever family-wise error rate we deem to be the highest acceptable value, and then store the p-values at every split. We can then simply query solutions at any given family-wise error rate under that upper bound. The result is that we can actually produce a range of solutions at different levels of conservativeness, which can help us understand the level of uncertainty in our data. An equivalent way to think about this is we can also just compute the adjusted p-value of any individual split as the infimum of the set of family-wise error rates at which we would have rejected the null hypothesis. This again gives us a different way to understand the level of uncertainty we have in each of the decisions that we make as we move through this tree. So everything I've described so far falls under that first implementation of our approach in which we produce clusters from scratch. As I mentioned, we also have a second version of our approach in which we can apply this framework to the setting where we already have pre-computed clusters. So for example, this might be preferable in a scenario where a certain algorithm is favored, or if some manually curated set of clusters has already been produced, um, and there's a question about a specific cluster. So to handle this scenario, we start by just hierarchically organizing the provided cluster labels, for example, by running hierarchical clustering on a distance matrix of the cluster centers, which then produces a tree where now the leaves represent entire clusters rather than individual cells as before. We can then just sequentially follow this tree in a very similar manner as the previous approach, where at every node we compare all the cells under labels to the left to all the cells under labels to the right. The end result of this process is we have a final set of clusters where we have potentially merged some of the labels, and we can interpret these clusters as satisfying our assumption of every cluster corresponding to a different distribution. A note I'll make here is that this process allows us to correct for any potential over-clustering in a set of pre-computed clusters, but not under-clustering. So we can potentially merge, but we can't further split pre-computed clusters. So here's a benchmark where we compare both implementations of our approach to existing clustering workflows using real data. I can describe the data sets that we constructed if there are questions about it, but in short, here I'm showing results for three data sets. So a data set we call the one population data set in which, as the name suggests, all the cells should belong to a single homogeneous population. We have a five populations data set in which there are instead five ground truth clusters. And then finally, the five similar populations data set in which we again have five ground truth clusters, but two of them differ by only 10 genes. So if you focus first on um, this first data set, the one population data set, 
Here in this top row, I'm reporting the results for that first implementation of our approach, which finds clusters from scratch, compared to several different popular existing clustering workflows. Over here, I'm reporting two metrics, K, which is the number of clusters that were found, and then ARI, which is the adjusted RAND index, summarizing the clustering accuracy. As you can see in this one population data set, our clustering approach was the only one that correctly found that there should just be a single cluster. And many of the other workflows found substantially more clusters, as many as 15 from SC3. Over here in the five populations data, our approach was one of just two that correctly found five clusters. And then finally, in the five similar populations data, our approach was the only one that found five clusters. And in fact, the majority of the other workflows actually combined those two very similar clusters. This shows that our approach will not only help prevent overclustering, but it's still not overly conservative and can still distinguish scenarios that are very similar, but not exactly the same. Now over here in each case, under the with significance analysis column, I'm showing results from applying the second implementation, our significance analysis workflow, on top of existing workflows. So as you can see, when applying the significance analysis framework to the outputs of these other clustering workflows, in the one population data, we were able to correctly collapse the outputted clusters into a single cluster every time. In the five populations data, we were able to reduce the number of clusters, sometimes to the correct value five, but still reducing the number of clusters and improving the ARI. And finally, in the five similar populations data, we were again able to reduce the number of clusters in every case. What I'll point out here is that in this data, because the majority of the existing methods had combined those two very similar clusters, in most of these cases, this four cluster solution was the best that could have been obtained. So in sum, our approach that finds clusters from scratch was able to outperform existing workflows. And we were also able to demonstrate that our significance analysis implementation can improve and reduce overclustering in nearly every case. So I'm now going to show a demonstration of our approach on real data in which we applied this significance analysis approach to clusters reported by the Human Lung Cell Atlas. So here we examined a total of approximately 66,000 cells from three different patients, in which the original study had identified 57 clusters, some of which were interpreted as novel cell types. We applied our approach with a family-wise error rate of 0.25 and ended up merging these 57 clusters into a final set of 45. Of these 45 clusters, 38 corresponded exactly to the original clusters, whereas the remaining seven combined anywhere from two to four of the original clusters, suggesting that there had been overclustering in these cases. As one example of identified overclustering, let's consider three of those original clusters, which were named the capillary error site, capillary and capillary intermediate clusters. Our approach chose to merge the capillary intermediate and capillary clusters while retaining capillary aerocytes as a separate cluster. So here's a visualization of these three clusters. If you focus first on this left part of panel A, this shows the portion of the hierarchical clustering tree pertaining to these three clusters. As you can see, the first node we encounter here proposes a split of the capillary aerocytes from the other two capillary-related clusters. Over here on the right, every point I'm plotting represents a cell, which is either light blue if it's a capillary aerocyte, or black if it's capillary or capillary intermediate. And so in particular, for every cell, I'm comparing expression of capillary aerocyte markers to capillary and capillary intermediate markers. As you can see, we see very strong separation between these two groups. And when considering these marker expression distributions marginally, we see very clear bimodal distributions. Since our approach did choose to separate the capillary aerocytes from the other two, this helps support why that decision was made. 
If we look now at panel B, the next node that we had encountered in the tree proposed a split between the capillary and the capillary intermediate cells. So now in this plot, the blue cells now represent the capillary cells and the black cells are the capillary intermediates. This time, we see much less separation between the two groups, and in particular, the marginal distributions of the marker expression is unimodal, not bimodal. This again helps explain why our approach might have chosen to merge these two clusters, and also illustrates an important idea here, which is that just because we merged these two clusters doesn't mean there isn't any interesting biological variation between them, it just means that this variation is not best captured with two discrete clusters. Instead, it may be that there is some kind of continuous variation or trajectory linking these two cell types together that would better describe these data than two distinct clusters. So I'm going to skip this next application in the interest of time and just jump to the summary here, which is that we introduced an approach to clustering that reports distinct populations with respect to an underlying model. We were able to both produce clusters from a hierarchical clustering pipeline and apply significance analysis to assess any provided set of clusters. We were able to demonstrate our approach on a real data benchmark and applied it to correct over clustering in the human lung cell atlas. So thank you, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Isabella, for a really very interesting talk. <clears throat> so I open um, basically the discussion for questions from the audience. If you have a question for Isabella, please feel free to raise a hand or pose um, a question in the chat, and I'll be happy to forward that to Isabella. And maybe I start off um, um, the round of question with um, a question regarding availability. Um, I think uh, it's pretty obvious that these are some very valuable um, contributions where I uh, assume many people will have an interest to try these um, things out and maybe apply your methods also to their data. Mm -hmm. Is is there um, a plan to turn these two um, methods um, into some sort of maybe bioconductor packages that would allow people to apply them easily? I could also imagine some sort of inclusion in the um, orchestrating single cell analysis with bioconductor would be very helpful to make people aware of these um, approaches. Is that something that you guys plan? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, currently they're not yet available as bioconductor packages, but we do have code available on GitHub for both of these methods. Um, so I guess I didn't put it here. I don't know what the easiest way to share it, but both of these are available on my GitHub and they're both um, I very much encourage people to use them and would love to get any feedback or questions from people on those as well. Mm -hmm. I guess the same holds also for these assessment data sets. It mm -hmm. seems that you have very carefully curated four different um, assessment data sets that are likely also of interest to people to access mm -hmm. and, and try out and incorporate maybe into their benchmarkings with regard to cell type annotations. Is that mm -hmm. something that is uh, available? Yes, yeah, so on the GitHub for our cell type annotation project, we also uh, share a link to uh, a fig share data set of all those assessment data sets. So mm -hmm. definitely encourage those to be used as well. Excellent, great. Um, there are questions from the audience. Um, Vince asks about the FV, um, um, family wise error rate mm -hmm. setting to um, a 0.25. This was um, uh, applied to the real data, right? I think. You chose yes. a, a different one for the simulated data, right? And and yeah. Vince Vask, uh, what's the rationale? And I would add to this question, um, uh, how, uh, uh, what just or, what were your like um, rational about like choosing different thresholds there for simulated and and real data? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the simulated data, we had used a family wise error rate of 0.05. Um, initially, in the real data, we had also applied a similar threshold, um, but since we wanted to be open to the fact that in real data, we would rather be a little bit less conservative and be more open to discoveries, we had raised the family-wise error rate to 0.25. Mm -hmm. 
But I will say that for a lot of the clusters of interest, so for example, like this example that I kind of discussed at length and some other examples that we examined more closely, we had found that these results were actually very robust to the threshold that was chosen. So I think, uh, for example, in this scenario, we only would have separated the capillary and the capillary intermediates at a family-wise, like a very large family-wise error rate, like something like over 0.5. Um, so in general, although choosing the actual threshold can sometimes feel a little arbitrary, we encourage and try to look at, at what family-wise error rate would the results change and use that to help understand how much confidence we have in the decisions being made. Yeah, I think also Nico points to the use of um, such a threshold, such as 0.25 and real data applications, indeed in the case of Prod's mm -hmm. gene set enrichment analysis. In the case of Prod's gene set enrichment analysis, I seem to remember this is um, the argument there is, is, is low power. Mm -hmm. um, is this, is the, does this argument also apply here? I think in general, one disadvantage of family-wise error rate can be that it's more conservative then, for example, methods that instead control the false discovery rate. Um, computationally speaking, it was simpler to control the family-wise error rate. And we found good performance by looking at a range of values and kind of assessing that level of uncertainty, as I mentioned. But one extension that I am actually interested in pursuing is also developing a method of hierarchical FDR control here, which could help, um, help against those issues of, of conservativeness. Mm -hmm. Other questions for um, Isabella. I got a question that was sent to me in private Ooh. that I would maybe um, put forward. It's mm -hmm. uh, also something that I'm wondering. It's a little bit around this whole notion of marker genes and where are they de derived from. So I think on the one hand side you were describing there are some problems with these established markers that apparently some resources put forward here, uh, the first question would be kind of like for me, what resources did you use to obtain these markers? Then these markers, um, this is the question that was sent to me in private. They seem to be primarily derived from something like facts sorting, right? Um, or, or, or do you know where, where, where they are derived from these markers? Are these really transcriptome markers or are these, these, these facts-based markers? And, 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 and then there's also the question what we observed a little bit like in these resources there, it gets a little bit lost whether these are positive or negative markers, right? So some markers that, that need to be there for the cell type to be declared the cell type as opposed to um, some markers that need to be absent to indicate um, the cell type. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is maybe the first part of the question that mm -hmm. I let go through. And Jacqueline, please weigh in if I uh, didn't... Um, um, transport your question appropriately. Yes, sorry. Um, sorry, I sent it just to Ludwig. I had to step away, so I wasn't sure if I missed it. Um, but so I'm just curious if you, this is a really cool technique. I'm curious if you've compared, if you've cross-referenced what you've seen, especially with the null versus the low expression with what we, because we have decades of flow mm -hmm. data on these markers, right? Mm -hmm. That's obviously surface expression, not RNA expression, which may not completely correlate. But I mean, especially in the field of immunology, we're constantly talking about like 14 low, 16 high, mm -hmm. for, you know, exactly. And so I'm just wondering if you've planned to cross-reference those, your method with that, and if you have, what have you seen? Yeah, that's actually a great question. So we haven't explicitly looked at those markers in relationship to these off and on, like these low and high distributions. I think that'd be really interesting. Something we did do was we took, um, we cross-referenced it with microarray data as like a kind of a somewhat independent validation of what we're seeing um, to help us understand if the off and on distributions we're capturing seem to reflect off and on distributions from like a different technology, so microarray. Yeah. Um, but it would be really interesting to look at flow markers like you suggest, especially since those are not derived typically from transcriptomic observations. Or, I mean, maybe the a good place to start would be with like FOXP3, mm -hmm. because when we, even mm -hmm. though we stain for that with flow, it's an intracellular mm -hmm. stain. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I mean, it may not make a difference. It's still protein versus RNA, but um, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be super interesting. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and uh, along these lines, I think you coined this during your talk as marker gene validation and discovery. Mm -hmm. 
and I, I think you have run there over like some 200 data sets from the Pang, Pangloa DB mm -hmm. and have come up with something like a data driven a validation of these markers that maybe resources provide, but also maybe a biomarkers that you find to be present for certain cell types in these data sets and that are maybe not uh, currently available in these resources. Is this something that is easily accessible? It seems to be a, a very valuable resource. Yeah, so we also, we did make public the code used for running it over the Penguin DB database. Um, something that we didn't make a, a big effort to curate together, but actually could be like a nice suggestion um, is actually publishing or sharing the list of marker genes that we found to be effective or not effective for different cell types. Um, what I showed earlier in the talk, which is kind of a, a small snippet of an example for CD4 cells, hmm. but we had done some more extensive looking at that. So that'd be a great suggestion. We could definitely try and make that available as a more general resource. That would be very interesting. Other questions? for Isabella. Hi, um, just a very simple question here. Um, since we're talking about kind of partition in terms of whether uh, kind of the distribution, uh, kind of like two distributions are better explanatory like um, model for a piece of data. I wonder how this behaves in continua that have like, uh, you know, very dense manifold of states thinking, you know, developmental trajectories and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, I'm scared of, you know, if we set up our alpha based on what we know exists and what we give, uh, what we ascribe meaning to, we'll fail to discover new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I guess something I would caution against is I would not interpret a lack of clusters as meaning a lack of meaningful variation. I would interpret it as just meaning that whatever we see is not best described by discrete clusters. So in the case where we have a trajectory of states, um, we may find that this approach would merge those together or call that as not having cluster structure, but really it might just mean that there's continuous variation that's better described by something from trajectory analysis than it would be from trying to call those as discrete clusters. So I would say this approach is most useful for distinguishing like completely distinct uh, transcriptional states rather than identifying um, trajectories, for which I think other methods would be better suited. That that calls for like that also like uh, a follow up question would be like mm -hmm. for example there are, I know that there, for clustering there's some benchmark um, kind of like ways of deciding your k are based on the idea that as you add k you get more kind of like each cluster is better explained as part of some normal distribution center around its centroid or something, mm -hmm. um, but you get penalized for complexity. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if, if the method assigns an entire trajectory as a single cluster that the explanatory uh, value of the distribution, the underlying distribution of that cluster kind of is underfit, kind of, right? Like you cannot really describe that as a log normal center around some mean anymore, because mm -hmm. if you look at, you know, the Chile and the Canada of the cluster, uh, mm -hmm. they'll have uh, very different expression values in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's like an extension of this idea that I'm interested in thinking more about is actually combining this idea of finding clusters with also assessing for continuous variation like trajectories. So I think in a scenario like the one you described, like that would be a situation where maybe multiple clusters are not the best to describe that group and instead some kind of continuous trajectory is. And I think it'd be very interesting to have a, a unified model that's actually checking for both possibilities. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> Not maybe one last question for me, uh, from my side. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering a little bit. So in, in your clustering part, it was a lot about like the notion of like under clustering or mm -hmm. over clustering, um, implying that there is something like a correct clustering or a true number of clusters. Mm -hmm. now, 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 some people say clustering, that's just something like a microscope, mm -hmm. right? Where you zoom in or zoom out, depending on, on the resolution that you, that you kind of like desire. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was just wondering whether you have any any thoughts of this? And if we are not trading in here, then maybe an alpha 
um, uh, in, in exchange for the resolution parameter and it becomes a little bit of question, how do I set my alpha in order to kind of like decide how many clusters I get as opposed to maybe setting my K or setting my resolution parameter. Just wondering whether you have any thoughts on this uh, on this one. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I definitely think it can get very, um, I think clustering in general can get very hairy in the question of choosing, you know, at what resolution do I describe my data? And so through our approach, the way I think about it is we're giving a, a very, a specific definition of what different clusters are, meaning we're saying that different clusters are groups of cells that follow different distributions. And so any clustering result that we produce, we can interpret through that lens. So even in the sense of family-wise error rate, we can say, you know, with a, a probability of, you know, 0.25 of making at least one mistake, this is a set of clusters that we think follows different distributions. Whereas in a more conventional clustering workflow where the decisions you made are purely based on just algorithmic output with different parameters, it's a lot harder to understand what those decisions might mean. So I would say, um, I think at the end of the day, I would never recommend, you know, just running this once and never looking at your results and calling it a day. But my hope is that we're giving some more precise meaning and interpretation to what the clusters are and kind of ascribing some level of statistical insight to the decisions being made. Perfect. Thank you very much, Isabella. Then I would say um, thank you so much for the talk and we leave it at that. Um, we will be back in two weeks.